Kevin Curry Knight, good to see you. I'm Dan Kaufman, how are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, welcome to everyone in the Sophia audience. Uh, Sophia is part of the bloggingheads.tv and meaningoflife.tv network. Um, it is the uh, Sophia programs available on video streaming and audio podcast. Uh, I'm Daniel Kaufman. I'm your host. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. Um, I also publish an online magazine called The Electric Agora. I'm here with Kevin Curry Knight, um, who people will be uh, familiar with since we've already done a dialogue together. I should say before I let Kevin say a few things about himself that Kevin now also is a writer for the Electric Agora and also will be hosting Sophia episodes when he wants um, as Robert Gress is already doing and it is it, it is my aim and my pleasure um, that I should not be the only host of this show and um, so uh, I'm very I'm very happy to, to, to have Karen Kevin on the uh, on the on the team. Um, Kevin, you want to say a little bit more since since you are still relatively new. Sure. Remind people who you are, where you teach, sure. the stuff you do, and then we'll get started. Yeah, so I am at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. I'm in the College of Education. I'm the guy who does philosophy of education, history, sociology of education, stuff like that. Um, overall obnoxious dude. Uh, yeah. Um, I do a lot of research in, again, philosophy of education, especially like self-directed education. Um, what happens when students have autonomy? Uh, how does that work? Stuff like that. But I also do philosophy in my spare time. Uh, so. And you've, uh, have you, you've, you've published a few books already, have you not? I published one book. Uh, I published one book, and, and we'll see there's a second book contract that looks like it could be coming. And what's the book you've already published? Yeah, the book I've already published is called Education in the Marketplace. Um, it's a really long subtitle, but what it is is a history of um, kind of liberta- market libertarian defenses of, of like markets in education over the 20th century and how each one of them was different. So Ayn Rand had her kind of case for markets and education. So did Milton Friedman, but they based it entirely on different philosophies. So it's like an intellectual history of how each of these people managed to get to the idea that like school choice. So it's, it's theoretical. It's not about like, for example, it's kind of like, the controversies over like, you know, having vending machines in schools or channel one and all, and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. So for each chapter, I pick a figure. There's, um, Albert J. Nock, Frank Chodorov, Murray Rothbard, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, uh, Myron Lieberman, all kind of big market libertarian defenders of school choice in the 20th century. And I go through each of their philosophies. How did they arrive at their philosophies? How did markets and education play a part in, in their philosophies? So like Ayn Rand kind of judges, uh, justifies markets and education as natural rights. We have like a natural right to, to educate our children uh, Milton Friedman was completely utilitarian. Like, I, I'm not even going to talk about natural rights. I'm going to talk about the utility of the marketplace and why we should have markets in education. Mm-hmm. So very different philosophies, but same stance in education. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and what was this, because I mentioned it and because I, and I remember it, and I don't even know whatever happened to it, but I remember it wasn't, couldn't have been that long ago, although for me, 20 years is not that long ago. Um there was a period when there was this talk about private uh, privatizing elements within schools. And I'm just remembering the channel one, which had commercials and stuff. Um, Was that, was that, were those sorts of initiatives, were they born out of these kinds of um, libertarian market theories or was Uh, that just entirely a ground level company decided to get involved in something Yeah, I don't know the origins of that phenomenon. I know the phenomenon you're talking about. Um, But I know that in market libertarian spaces within education, there was really no talk about privatizing things within schools. In fact, it's all about school choice and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, most most market libertarians like that I studied in my in my book would have said that's that's kind of like getting in bed with the devil. It's like if you want markets, don't have public private partnerships. Mm. just go all the way private because public private partnerships end up um, essentially, well, they would say public, the public aspect ends up sullying the private aspect. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Well, th- this is not what we're here to talk about today, and maybe we will talk about it someday. Um, maybe what maybe what I need to do is read I'll the send book you a and copy if you want to read the book. Yeah. If you have a copy, hold it up. Sure. Uh, I don't have a copy with. Oh, me. okay. But maybe you know, I'll 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 read it and we'll talk about it because it does sound um interesting and um you can link in the show notes if you want. Is not a topic that um gets discussed very much on blogging heads, and certainly it's one I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are on both sides of the school choice d- debate, for example. Yeah. And so that would be something that, you know, we could I, talk about on a future. I wrote it, by the way, as neutrally as I could. I'm, I'm quite pro-market in education, and I wrote it as if, if someone who's anti-market were to read this just as kind of to understand the history of it, they wouldn't hopefully detect any real bias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not you're not advancing a thesis. That's right. Yeah, it's a survey of... of a historical survey, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we are here today to talk about is a cluster of issues. So the genesis of this was that um, in the last or one of not the last, maybe the second last, a recent uh, a Glenn show episode had at the beginning a kind of what I can only describe as a sort of a hagiography of, of Coleman Hughes, um, who had been named 30 under the top 30 under 30 by Forbes or one of these sorts of things. And um, I had expressed in the comments section, uh, uh, I had lamented that it seemed like Coleman Hughes was just diving straight into movement conservatism. Of course, he's uh, his, his most recent big achievements was he's uh, joined the Manhattan Institute and writes for city journal and you really can't get more movement conservative than that other than maybe National Review um, and the Heritage Foundation are the only other things I can think of that are m- more con- movement conservatism or equally movement conservative. So I lamented this. There was a whole back and forth of the number of people. I mentioned my own experience in movement conservatism as an attempt to try to explain why I was concerned for Coleman uh, yeah. from Mr. Hughes. Um, um, and um, Kevin thought this was interesting enough that we could talk about it, not just about Hughes, but about movements, movement conservatism, and then movements more generally, intellectual dark web um, as connected to that, uh, the, that constellation of topics. And then also uh, uh, both Kevin and my own experiences in movements yeah. um, and maybe why both of us kind of um, both of us have similar reasons for being concerned about uh, Mr. Hughes's uh, uh, very, very early in his life yeah. dive straight into uh, straight into uh, movement conservatism. So that's what we're going to talk about. This was almost all Kevin's ideas. And so we're going to do this sort of backwards. Kevin's going to host today, really, and I'll be more responding to him. So, uh, Kevin, why don't you uh, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Right. So we wanted to start with with Coleman Hughes. Um, I'm just going to call him Mr. Hughes because I don't want yeah. anybody to even remotely for a second think I'm condescending to the man. Yeah, yeah. I don't know him personally. Yeah. But I don't feel I don't feel that I should should engage in with him at a level a certain level of familiarity that's yeah. uh like so i'm gonna just call him mr hughes it's like how everyone calls sam harris sam <laughs> like all the, yeah, all but the sam harris people. there's nobody's going to be think that they're condescending to him but coleman yeah, is so young right, right, that right, someone right. easily could take me as condescending to him and that is yeah. not my intention at right, all well, let's well let's start there so you and i ended up on the comment section of the glenn show that episode it was probably uh two and some weeks ago it was an episode of john mcwhorter and, and glenn lowry and they were talking about Coleman Hughes being on the most recent 30 under 30 Forbes list. And yeah, they were definitely um, really Lowry and McWhorter were very pleased with that. You and I ended up on the comments because we expressed a similar skepticism, I think. Um, okay, but let's start there then. Um, why don't we diffuse the idea that either of us are trying to condescend to Coleman Hughes? Because our arguments, which I think were pretty similar, were, he may not realize it, but he's sort of locking himself into a viewership that over time will expect him to say certain things over and over and over again to the point where he may end up kind of locking himself out of a certain intellectual freedom. Like I always like to, I always think, um, okay, what if he wakes, what if Mr. Hughes wakes up in a week and a half 
and wakes up. I mean, literally not like, you know, metaphorically religiously wakes up, wakes up literally like in the morning, another, wakes up. Yeah. <laughs> takes another look at the 1619 project or black lives matter and says, you know, this is actually pretty good stuff. I'm going to do some episodes on why black lives matter is, is, is a really amazing organization. Right. I suspect that he will get a lot of blowback for that. And more sadly to me, I've looked at at least his viewing numbers on YouTube, um, which doesn't reflect all the podcast downloads, but I have to imagine it's the same. The episodes where he has someone on like Peter Singer and they don't talk about race are episodes that seem to have a noticeable dip in listenership. I I think he's, I, I, he, he's done more than one with Singer. No, he's done one with Singer, and I don't think they talked about race. Oh, okay, I see. Because it just wasn't relevant. He did another episode with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it, which I didn't, I didn't get a chance to listen to, but in the description of the podcast, it mentions that Neil deGrasse Tyson and Coleman Hughes talk about race, and that was one of the first things that was mentioned. And I'm like, why, if you have a physicist on who's really interesting, would you advertise as one of the first things that we talk about race? Yeah. It's, like, I, I feel like whether he knows it or not, whether it's deliberate or not, he's potentially locking himself into an audience that if he were to wake up in a year and say, you know, I want to go on and do some other stuff. I want to talk about other things. I don't know how well that would go. That's my concern. And I think you share a similar concern with that. Yeah, my my my, I I do share that concern, but my, I also had additional ones, and so, and and they do relate. I mean, so my initial my my engagement with Hughes is primarily reading his stuff, not listening to his podcast. I've listened to his podcast um, uh, a few episodes, not all of them. I've listened to a bunch of them, but it's primarily through his writing, um, and then also he gave te- he gave testimony on reparations. Him and Tana Hesse Coates were on giving their testimony, yeah. and it was actually during that testimony that I really kind of it it the, 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 this first consideration struck me. Um, Mister Hughes is very young, has has merely, and I'm going to say merely has merely an undergraduate education, which means he has about he has the same education as. An awful lot of people, okay. Um, none of none of whom are opinion writers, right? Um, and um, really, uh, because of his age, you know, this is just simply almost analytic, right? Very little experience, right? And so, my first thought was just like, you know, I just don't know why anyone would be all that interested in what someone with very little experience, very young and the amount of education that a lot of the average Joe has, why anybody would be interested in their views on really much of anything. Right. I mean, I mean, when I was 20, when I was that age, it would never have even occurred to me to sort of think that I had any, anything that was of enough interest to say that I would want to broadcast it to thousands of potentially hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And, um, but because of my own experience, and we're going to talk later about my experience in movement conservatism, but yeah. because of my own experience, I did kind of know what he was going to, what, what was going to happen. Right. So yeah. coming in as he is with no real sort of, um, 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 thought identity of his own, right. Without sort of, without sort of a real basis, um, 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 and depth, um, um, both of experience and ideas, what he would be doing would be brought on, but he would be brought on and kind of, um, involved in a col- collective effort of people. Basically, I'm going to put it this way, propagandizing, right. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, which is, you know, ultimately what, what movements, uh, and their, and their agents do. Right. Right. And so, you know, you come into the Manhattan Institute, you come into city journal. um, What you are being brought in to do is to um, produce content that is going to advance the cause of the movement. That's what you're doing. And if you don't have an already well fleshed out broad and deep um, identity of your own, that's going to become your identity. Right. Right. 
Right. And that's why I said, I said, you know, at one point I said, great, he's going to turn into a mini, he's going to be mini Glenn. Right. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The difference between him and Glenn is that Glenn had an enormous career, depth of experience, huge um, um, involvements with major institutions and so forth before he started opining publicly. And as a related point, he didn't need the in. He wasn't solely reliant on income generated from like this one. That's right. That's right. And 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 you know, I was going to say something uh, similar about another guy who we both know. And I was going to actually ask you, um, maybe to explain what the difference is. So, like, I don't have the same fear about Spencer Case, right? So Spencer Case, yeah. um, who's also been on the on the yeah. on the on the program. Yeah. Um, has a PhD in philosophy, um, has been a professor, has taught students, um, le- was, was a professor at Wuhan University and went through the whole fucking uh, corona thing and being locked in there and then having to be airlifted out by the State Department. I mean, this kind of stuff, right? Um, now, he goes and writes for National Review. Right. But Spencer has a far greater range of experience, a far deeper, more trained intelligence um and a much and he's older yeah and as a much more stronger personal identity right um and so i just don't see him i don't see his identity being and 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 by his identity i include the identity of his right of his work yeah as being so completely defined by yeah the movement um now, one thing I was going to ask you, but maybe, you know, what we, what I've just said now is going to sort of point towards the answer is why, you know, so one of the things Spencer did was he wrote a, he wrote an essay that they published in National Review that was anti factory farming and pro vegan. Hmm. Right. And why do you think National Review, which is debt, which is the flagship movement conservative magazine, would publish something completely contrary to the, their readers' views. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas, so whereas right. you're worried that Coleman, if he tr- if he runs a foul, I'm yeah. sorry, Mr. Hughes, if they if he runs a foul, is going to get disciplined. Right. Well, um, first of all, I don't know the article in question. Were those the main points? It was arguing against factory farming and pro vegan. That was the main point of the article, or was that, that was the point? entire article? Okay, then was it like, uh, you know, I, I recall several people like Jason Riley and, and some others in the conservative camp writing the conservative case for, you know, immigration, uh, pro-immigration or, or conservative case for gay marriage. Was it something like that? Was it like he's grounded? It was, it was, it was definitely a call, an argument for ethical veganism that we have an obligation. Right. To be vegans and to cease and to, and to eliminate this, this, uh, factory farming industry, right? right? Um, and, and so, unlike immigration, on which the conservative tent includes both the restrictionists, those right. are, those will be your paleos, right? And, right. and open border types, those will be your libertarians, right? Those groups already exist within the conservative movement. But there ain't no ethical vegan get rid of factory farming uh, uh, wing yeah. of the, of the no, conservative no, I mean, movement. There's, there's nothing. It doesn't sound like, though, there's anything inherently hostile in conservatism towards that position, if you can argue a conservative case for it, right? It's not like um, – it's not like – But couldn't you make a conservative case for Black Lives Matter? Right. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, like, I don't think, I think there's certain things that are so central to the conservative position overall that you just couldn't put that in national review. Yeah. I don't know about veganism. I don't, it, I don't know many conservatives who would hang their hat or even anything like their hat on that issue. The only conservative I can think of that I would have identified with environmentalism um, is Rogers is the late Roger Scruton. Okay. Right. But his environmentalism was of a kind of stewardship of the earth sort of idea that was probably tied into his Christianity, which was a very important part of his thought. Right. And, um, and also a person of that standing can kind of do what they like, whatever right. movement they're in. Right. And like, what I was going to say about Spencer and Hughes was, I was going to say probably maybe a, the reason Spencer can do it is because he has a level of standing that, that Mr. Hughes just doesn't have. 
Although Spencer is not nearly as well known, but Spencer right. is far better credentialed, right? I mean, right. he's far he's right. far superior um, in terms of his actual the merit of 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 the, the, the substance of what he says because he actually um, has greater greater experience, greater right. age, and, and far greater not, and far, it's not his shtick, it's far not, greater education. Um, but also not, because he's not he's not on the staff of National Review. I mean, these are one offs, right? Right. right. Um, um, and it's and it's not. It, I I don't know this about Spencer, but that's not like his specialty area. Is no, he made, he's made a career arguing, you know, I don't want to say the same case because I don't think, I think that would be um, condescending to Mr. Hughes to say that. Um, but yeah, like if, if Mr. If Mr. Hughes were to write something that was pro 1619 project or race is a much more salient factor than we think, and we should, you know, um, all imbibe Ibram Kendi's themes. I don't think his audience would be at all receptive Yeah, because yeah. that's, been his theme like that race has been his theme yeah and he has a certain view and to about face on that view which is like spencer is not about facing on anything when he writes about veganism because that's not what he's been writing about i guess my main concern about mr hughes is not so much that that he's if he tries to sort of you know go off the reservation he's going to get excommunicated my concern more is that by by diving into movement conservatism so early yeah. um, he's going to stunt his own development. I mean, in other words, he's never going to become an interesting thinker right. because he's going, he's entering the movement too early. Right. Um, he, he's entering the movement at a time when he should still be forming. Right? right. And if he forms from within the movement, he's going to form, he's going to, like I said, become mini Glenn, yeah, and there's I just just nobody needs another Glenn, right? I mean, you just really don't, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, an, another thing that we should say about Glenn, and by the way, John McWhorter, um, which is kind of ironic given what they're talking about with with Mr. Hughes, both of them I've heard in various forums in different ways have talked about at some point realizing that they were unwittingly, often, almost being used by conservative folks to be like, Hey, look, here's, here's some black academic voices who are saying what we think. Yeah. Um, I mean, John has said that in the sense of he's very adamantly not a conservative politically. And he said, you know, it's, it got to the point where the only people who are inviting me to speak were these conservative organizations. Yeah. Like, I do it because I want to, to do the speaking, but I really wish that other people would invite me to, to things because I don't want to be this. Yeah. And of course, in, in Glenn's case, he's very publicly changed his mind about things. I, I don't know the exact story, but I think as Glenn told it, he was at dinner with a colleague. I don't know who it was, who was part of the conservative movement. And the colleague said something like, and you know, Glenn, the problem with those people, which obviously was directed at black people. And I think the way Glenn said it was like, first of all, the fact that he would say that to me meant that he thought that I would just agree with him about those people. And secondly, he's like, I grew up with those people. <laughs> so, and that was, I think when he said like, I, I knew at that point that I, what I thought I was doing um, or what the groups that I thought I was being a part of and what I thought they had me in, in these rooms for may not have been what I was in these rooms for. So it's interesting to me to hear them talk about, kind of the ascendancy of, of Mr. Hughes and, and the accomplishment of Forbes 30 under 30. And it is a good accomplishment. We should say, like, I, I don't begrudge him that accomplishment. Um, I don't, I don't begrudge him anything. And, and, and it's not as if um, um, he should give a crap about what I say about it. I mean, right. um, um, but it, is, it is interesting to hear Glenn and John who have both talked about kind of the, the sadness in a way that comes from being sort of locked in to this movement conservative thing, almost against your will. Yeah, being sort of co-opted. And they're talking about Coleman, and I mean, I don't know if they see it the way I see it, but that's the road up ahead. Yeah, like that's the road up ahead. That if 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 uh, if they're wise, he, Mr. Hughes will uh, will do well to kind of avoid. Yeah, I don't know if it's avoidable. Yeah. to your point. I mean, look, look, Glenn is a major major public intellectual as well as a very accomplished academic. Um, um, you know, I mean, I don't have to ex- explain this. Everybody knows that. Um, yeah. um, um, and uh, he, he earns my respect by, by having publicly changed his mind 
So. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, that I mean, the direction in which he's gone lately strikes me as as the direction in which he's gone has made him far less interesting to me than than he once was. I mean, what yeah. he once was was a kind of guy that really had a very sort of um, 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 independent, original point of view, and that it was a, it, his positions on things were a, a combination that you didn't that you couldn't tag. Um, so you know prior to what seems like the recent sort of love affair with Amy Wax, um, um, uh, Glenn had actually his first discussion with Wax, he was very, very tough on her yeah. um, um, precisely for her sort of grotesque oversimplifications and cavalier treatment yeah. Yeah. of the very serious issue having to do with um, the history of, uh, of black America and um, uh, the current, uh, the ongoing uh, difficulties faced by uh, portions of black America, very tough on her. And I recall that he, and we're going to link to all of these in the link section. I recall that he did it in part because she had done a previous interview with someone else and had just completely overrun them. Hmm. And so Glenn wanted to make sure that she got challenged, got pushed hard, and he did. But then, I don't know when it happened, but there reached a point to where he became, in my view, and I'm sure this will get me a lot of hate in the comments, um, he became entirely predictable. At this point, if you gave me any topic, right, I could write a Glenn Lowry essay on it. I right. mean, I mean, I, I'm not not saying necessarily the voice, but the content, I could write it. And and my problem with Mr. Hughes is. I have yet to read a single thing by him that I I couldn't, but after the you know seeing what the topic is, predict every single thing he's going to say about it, because it's just black movement conservative views, right? I mean that that's what it is. And let me, let me, um, let me go back. Yeah. Let me go back if you don't mind. Two things that you had said earlier, and I want to kind of offer counter like counter arguments just to see what what your response would be. So I'll, I guess I'll give you both at the same time, unless you want me to go one by one. Um, first, you had mentioned, okay, you know, Mr. Hughes is, is uh, obviously uh, an under, he, he graduated with, he has his bachelor's in philosophy from Columbia. Um, he's not really formed. Why would anyone particularly be interested in what he has to say? And I could see someone um, coming back and saying, well, it's precisely because he's young. Uh, if, if, you know, if if John McWhorter were to say something, you know, I think he's in his fifties, maybe. John McWhorter yeah. is about my is about my age. You know, yeah. he's more formed, but he's not going to resonate with a certain audience. Let's say millennials, post millennials, they're not going to resonate because it's just the age gap is too large. Coleman um, looks like them, sounds like them, speaks like them, listens to their music. Um, so, in in a sense, it's true he's not formed, but in another sense all the better that he's a younger person to connect with people of that age bracket. Is that generally true? I mean, is that generally true? I don't know. We, we I mean, have, I mean, I don't recall. I mean, when I wrote for, when I wrote, I wrote for the national review and we'll get to my case later, but yeah. I wrote for national review in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um, but at that point, I already was pretty much almost done with a PhD program. I had already worked in virtually every possible sector of the economy that you could work in. I mean, from the lowest of the low, I mean, you know, like dishwasher in a supermarket. I mean, that kind of thing, all the way up to teaching uh, college courses right. um, in a wide variety of institutions. Um, I'd already worked in the theater. I mean, I did, I'd done all sorts of stuff. Um, and um, I was older. Um, but I don't recall any of the any of the organs back in the '90s or earlier thinking, "Oh boy, if we don't have a bunch of 19 year olds writing for our 20 year olds writing for us, you know how you know how are we going to reach young people?" I, and, I mean, that, that, I've never yeah. re recall that being like a concern, right? I can see it both ways because on one hand, you have an obvious counterexample like Jordan Peterson somehow is connected with these young men, but obviously he's not anywhere close to the age yeah. that they are. But then again, there's other examples where like if Barry Weiss was 15 years older, would anyone have cared? Like, would she have gotten the same reception? Yeah. I have no idea how old Barry Weiss, Weiss is actually. Um, I mean, um, she, she, she looks, she always struck me as young ish. 
I think, I mean, I, I don't know, but... Um, Let's see how old Barry Weiss is. <laughs> but I, I, I feel like if she were 15 years older... You know, it's like Megan Daum wrote in her amazing book, The Trouble well, with... Well, Barry Emma. Weiss is... is, uh, is Closer to forty than to thirty. I mean, oh, okay. yeah, well, she's yeah, not okay. that young. I mean, okay. um, she was born in nineteen eighty four. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But anyway, um, 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 I take your point, and, and well, also you okay. may argue, you might want to argue that with the new medium, um, right. that things that things are different. That 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 there is more more yeah. of a need to have I mean, other, actual young people. Yeah. The other counter argument that I would offer is we're talking about movement conservatism as something that. Mr. Hughes is in danger of locking himself into. And I just want to point out that, first of all, I don't think that's what he thinks he's doing. And for an obvious example, he very publicly did um, an article in an episode of his podcast about why I'm voting for Joe Biden. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, when I listened to that episode, what he said, the case he made was much more movement conservative friendly than I thought it would be. It was, look, if you think Trump is going to, um, solve the anti-woke problem, I think Biden's going to solve the, 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 you know, Biden's going to kind of dull the woke movement. So I'm going to vote for Biden for very conservative reasons because I want the woke movement to dip down. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, he's definitely making gestures of, look, I, I want to express views that are not movement conservative. Kind well, of but I don't know. I mean, that's, that, that's sort of tricky because of Trump, right? I mean, I mean, um, you know, Jonah Goldberg is a movement conservative. David French is a movement conservative. Um, um, Will Bill right. Crystal is a movement conservative. Right. They're all virulently anti-Trump. I mean, Trump isn't a conservative at all, right? Well, Andrew um, Sullivan. Um, um, yeah, Andrew Sullivan. Although the conservatives have kind of chucked him. Um, yeah. He's he's almost transcends because he's so yeah. big. Yeah. He almost transcends. Um, but. I mean, movement conservatism right now is kind of having a, you know, I'm sure that a lot of not most of the folks over at City Journal and Manhattan Institute are anti-Trump yeah. um, because, I mean, yeah. the only, I mean, yeah. you really can't have any brains and intellectual and honesty and then right. be pro-Trump, right? So, I mean, you know, you, you, you either have to be stupid or dishonest or some combination of the both. Yeah. And like I said, or utterly heard, mercenary, right? I mean, like, yeah. And like I said, when I heard that, when I listened to that episode, because that was my concern is that, you know, Mr. Hughes is going to lock himself into this movement inadvertently. I listened to this episode of why I'm voting for Biden. I thought this is going to be great. He's going to finally, you know, say some stuff that isn't the stuff conservatives would want to hear. But then, like I said, his argument struck me as very conservative. Yeah. um, Almost conservative adjacent, I guess I would say. Like it was all about if you want to stop wokeness, Trump's not your answer. It's going to make it worse. Biden is your answer. He's going to make it better. And I'm like, I agree with that, generally speaking, but. That's a pretty conservative reason to vote for Trump, isn't it? Or to vote for Biden. Yeah. Um, Um, And listen, I mean, the man can be a conservative as he wants. I mean, that's not my issue. My issue is more. Well, I don't think he, I I guess my point is I don't think he understands himself at all to be a conservative. My my issue more is whether he's going to be able to develop into an actually interesting, deep, you know, complex thinker or whether we're just going to get, you know, another another uh, black movement conservative, which they are, are, is very much a one note and one note sort of thing. Right. I mean, yeah. Um, um, and, clearly uh, he has aspirations to do other stuff. Like yeah. He has, yeah. And look, of, we're not uh, expressing like serious fear for his future. The man is going to do fine no matter what he does. It's more on my part of lamentation. I actually really like his voice and I'm kind of like, oh, damn, no, don't, don't go with them. So don't go with them now. I mean, you know, yeah. let's see what you turn into, right? I mean, let's, let's see what you, right. before you hitch, hitch on to something. Yeah. Um, but I, none of us, we're, we're not, we're not really worried about him. I mean, the guy's going to do fine no matter yeah. what he does. It's more of um, a lamentation. I, mean, I, guess, I guess the other thing to articulate about kind of my concern is not, I don't think he's like unaware of what, like he can handle his business. I'm not saying he's he's. Oh, not, absolutely. I'm not. I do not mean to condescend. Saying, yeah, no, I don't mean to condescend to him. Uh, it's, but I am. But I am sort of saying, and maybe yeah. this works us into talk about the intellectual dark web. Yeah. So, so, so there's what he thinks he's doing, 
and there's what he might end up discovering he has to do. So that's it's interesting to IDW because people have also um, attached that label to McWhorter and to that's Lowry, right. and they haven't kind of necessarily rejected it. I think I remember Lowry making noises like um, he didn't give a sh- he didn't give a crap, but I could be wrong. Do you know whether they've? I think uh, I think John pretty straight up said I don't I don't have an interest in being part of a. Uh, a group. Yeah. Sam Harris came out and made an explicit statement. He did. He said, I want nothing to do with these people. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and yeah. And I actually um, would say something almost as, uh, as strong and we're going to, we'll get to that, but let me, uh, before, you know, as a way of into it, let me ask you. Yeah. I've been saying all along that Coleman, that, that Mr. Hughes is, is, and I'm saying Mr. Hughes to be, so because I want to be very clear that I am not condescending to the man. That's right. And I don't know him personally, so I'm not going to assume a, a level of familiarity that I don't have. Yeah. Um, I've been saying he just dove right into movement conservatism. Um, and then my reason is because Manhattan Institute and City Journal. But to me. I think you could also argue that he's diving into IDW. And a question that that then raises is, is IDW now a part of movement conservatism? So why don't we... Um, why don't, why don't you why don't, why don't you talk us through that? Yeah, well, um, I mean, the IDW came on my radar probably the way it came on a lot of people's radar. Um, within the first year or so of Dave Rubin's show, I started kind of watching because I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, here's this ostensibly liberal person who always reminded you that he was liberal. Having these conversations. And gay, and gay, I should add. And gay, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, as he likes to say, I'm gay married. Um, yeah. So how could I be a, a conservative? Um, and he would always remind you that he was liberal and, and gay. And he would have conversations with other liberals who were seemingly experiencing some of the same tensions with liberalism that he was. And I tell you, I remember maybe the second year of the show, I saw what I thought was the writing on that wall. Because when you have Miley Yiannopoulos on the show and you have like, I think it was Mike Cernovich came on the show in fairly short order and some others. And you look at the ratings and the ratings were very high on those shows. Uh, and then you would have some other people on and they, they weren't quite as high. Didn't he have the, the execrable the Candace movie? Owens on? Didn't he have the execrable Candace Owens on? That was, that wasn't within the first two years, I don't think. Mm. Um, but it was, it wasn't that far after that, but you could, I could just see the, this tug. Um, and I don't know if it was like, I don't know exactly what happened, but I felt like what's going to happen is he is going to lock himself into an audience that over time is going to expect the same talking points. Those talking points are uh, anti-political correctness. It's a shame that you can't offend people anymore. Um, Islam is bad. It's a threat to the West, Western values. Um, there was one or two others. And the difficulty is that those talking points have a huge overlap with a conservative audience. And what I saw is those talking points become more and more and more prevalent until at some point the show, like you said about uh, maybe Glenn Lowry, just became predictable. Well, and, but he, he, I just started watching the shows. And I'm like, I know exactly what you're going to say. Before I watch the show, why am I watching the show? And you know he's migrated even farther. He's oh, now he's, full-blown Trump conspiracist. That's right. The, the, yeah, he's definitely done that. And I, I feel like it's a, it's. I mean, obviously, you know, everyone kind of agrees that Dave Rubin is kind of the low-hanging fruit of the IDW. He just wasn't. Maybe him and Ben Shapiro just didn't quite have the, um, the muster that some of the others did. But it's kind of a. It's it's just a, a micro. It's a it's it's a microcosm of what the IDW has done to me. Yeah, it's become so almost beholden to a sort of movement conservatism. Even when Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein um, make gestures of saying like, "No, I'm not one of you guys. I'm not one of you guys. I voted for Bernie." Wait a minute. Um, Eric Weinstein is he the one that coined the damn term? Yeah. See my, ent- my my entry my my familiarity with or awareness of IDW started with the Weinstein's. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Um, um, so you were a latecomer. Um, yeah, I don't even I don't even know if I knew that it existed before the Weinstein's. Right? I mean, 
Well, it um, didn't exist until it, the phrase was coined, but yeah. Yeah. But I mean, this collection of people that supposedly, you know, includes Ben Shapiro, who's definitely, you know, a movement conservative. Yeah. Um, um, and then Dave Rubin and then Joe Rogan, I've heard right. included in I, this. I still don't understand exactly why he was lumped into that. Um, and um, then the Weinsteins and Sam Harris. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really kind of wondered what, what it was supposed to, what, what the term was supposed to connote. Right. I mean, um, if, if it's supposed to connote, you know, people who say things you're not allowed to say, right. Yeah. Um, isn't that, isn't that true of all this conservatives? I mean, I mean, given that the cultural zeitgeist is dominated by progressive and woke politics because it's controlled by, you know, the media outlets that are in Los Angeles and New York, essentially, mm-hmm. um, um, anything any conservative says is automatically going to be stuff that's, that's not allowed. And they say it all the time. I mean, they've got their magazines full of it. Right. So, so I didn't understand how that was anything kind of new. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, well, before we start, before we start kind of getting into the criticism of the IDW, it probably, because, because I know we're going to veer negative. Why don't we, is there anything good that we should say about the IDW? What came out of the IDW? I'm assuming the IDW is an RIP at this point. It, I mean, Sam Harris has distanced himself. Eric Weinstein has said some things about how this didn't work the way we thought it would. Um, is there anything good that we should say about what happened as part of the IDW and what that's kind of what I said, why I said to you, what I did is that I, I never understood what the term was supposed to connote that we already don't kind of already have. Right. I mean, I mean, if it's supposed to be, Oh, these are people that say things that are sort of verboten in the contemporary environment. Well, that's just true of every conservative writer in the country. Right. I mean, so, so that's not anything new. If it's supposed to be, well, it's a bunch of people, not all of whom are conservatives are doing this. That seems yeah. like pretty weak sauce. I mean, that's not something to sort of make a movement. Of. Now, Barry Weiss did have a whole article about these people, right? Well, I um, think I think I, I remember the article, and I remember at the time thinking, I don't hear any. I'm not hearing anything here that's that's new, right? I mean, I think what so I think what um, maybe positions them, at least in my mind, is a little bit different from movement conservative from National Review, is that these were a bunch of people, with the exception of Ben Shapiro who didn't fancy themselves ever as part of, as a conservative voice, right? Dave Rubin, Brett Weinstein, I think those two especially always said, I am of the left. I still consider myself of the left. And here are the problems I'm starting to notice with a left that I feel like has gone so far as to leave me behind. So I feel like, I mean, Think about the phenomenon that Megan Daum writes about in her amazing book. You had her I interviewed her. The show. Yeah. Amazing book. If people yeah. haven't read it, it's the yeah. trouble with everything or the problem with everything. Do you remember? I have it here. Hold on. I'm going to hold it up. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to keep talking while you do that then. Um, yeah. The phenomenon that she writes about is a phenomenon that I think a lot of people can relate to, which is when you're young, yep, the problem with everything. There it is. If you haven't read it, do so. I, I – I started the book thinking, oh, this is going to be like uh, an article that, that, that should have stayed an article. And it was, it was absolutely fascinating. Well, and also, and also you would have thought that it was going to be this kind of, by now again, predictable kind of yeah, anti-woke kind of thing. Amazing. And Megan defies really that sort of, yeah, she's not IDW. She's not conservative. And that's sense, she's like Laura Kipnis, right? Yeah. Um, 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 right. So, so the IDW, I think was able to, identify with people that are basically the people Megan Daum is talking about in her book. People who thought they were liberal, thought they were leftists. I'm a feminist. I'm a liberal. I care about race issues. I care about equality. Um, But all of a sudden I wake up one day and all of my left, all of my left friends are telling me I'm a racist. Right. All of my left friends are telling me I'm a sexist because I'm not going far enough. Yeah. And you saw this with a lot of folks. I mean, Dave Rubin ostensibly exited the left. Brett Weinstein was basically kicked out of, of, uh, or run out of, um, his university. Laura Kipnis found herself on the wrong side. Um, uh, 
geez, I, I'm drawing a blank. Wasn't it a title nine? It was a, it was all about title nine. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot of names. I mean, Megan Daum is another one of them. Um, Although Megan Daum wasn't, I don't think wasn't, wasn't chucked out of anything. I think Megan Daum just sort of. She just woke up and found that all of her friends who were also on the left that she thought she shared values with. Yeah. We're now saying you're, you're a sexist because you don't think that every situation involves a power differential. Listen, you could say the same about the feminine chaos ladies, right? Yes. Um, yes. Um, um, Rosenfield and, yeah. Phoebe, and Phoebe. Phoebe. Yeah. 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 Another good book, the perils of privilege. Phoebe Maltz Bovey. Very good. Yeah. And I, 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 I signed up for their, um, their Patreon when they, when they, when they left uh, blogging heads. Um, um, I'm, I'm trying to support the young ones, the young yeah. people who, yeah. the younger people who don't have established platforms. Oh, well, well, okay. So there's two others that were basically kind of run out of the, the left wing spaces. Um, yeah. Jesse single, and Katie Herzog, whose podcast um, blocked and reported. Yeah, yeah, People yeah. To, uh, you, I think, more than I do. Yeah, I'm a subscriber to that, too. I don't know how often I listen to any of them just because I'm not very much of an audio podcast guy, um, but I do want to support up-and-coming journalists. I mean, I, I really do. And then the environment now, the, the fiscal the financial environment is so catastrophic. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually very unhappy about this trend towards uh, pay, pay, patreonization and sub stacking and all of this to where now I've got to subscribe to 20 things yeah. and, and pay for them all piecemeal. Um, I, I'm very much unhappy about it. I'm very unhappy about what it's hap that is happening at blogging heads, but that's entirely separate from, okay, but this is the reality of what's happening. And, if you don't support the young journalists, they're going to just die. Right. I mean, they're just not going to, they're just not going to happen. And so, um, so, you know, that's why, while I'm dislike the trend, yeah. nonetheless, I'm going to support the young, the young, the younger, the up and coming people. Um, yeah. But yeah anyway, go on. So, but, but about IDW, none of these people are IDW though. Um, right. Well, I mean, but, but, they're not necessarily IDW, but I think those were the people who were able to, like Megan Daum says in her book, kind of listen to folks in the IDW and say, like, oh, I'm, I'm not alone. So, mm. it, it, yeah, it, Megan does explicitly say that. Yeah. It brings, it brings me to one of the problems that I have with the IDW. It's, it's, it's potentially a, a benefit in some ways, but it's a, it's a huge drawback in other ways that IDW involves what I like to call people consuming media therapeutically. Um, to the extent that cognition is a social process, we look at others around us to gauge not only what to believe, but whether the beliefs we hold are sane, crazy, good, bad. Um, and, you know, I think Megan does a really good job in, in her book of articulating, like, I was looking around me and I, like you, at some point, people are calling you sexist enough where you have to ask yourself, like, am I Am I sexist and I don't realize it? So when you when you find the Dave Rubens and the Brett Weinsteins and the Eric Weinsteins of the world, you can binge on them because what it is is for those people, it's an hour and a half of therapy with really smart people reminding you that you're not crazy. And that's, a, in some ways, that's a good thing. Like, I mean, that's a good thing. It, it's, a, it's a sort of validation. I think we all do it in, in our heart of hearts. We all listen to podcasts that we know we're going to agree with we tend not to listen to stuff we, we know we're going to disagree with, except maybe from time to time. If I look on your bookshelf, I'm pretty sure I could figure out what a lot of your positions are. It's same with my bookshelf. Um, it's therapy. It's, it's therapeutics. But the downside of that is that it involves essentially the IDW being a contradiction. They say that they're this open environment of people just wanting to have honest and intrepid conversations but what they really are is people who are, whether it's deliberate or not, making their money because they're parroting back to the viewers what the viewers' own biases are. And saying, you viewers are not crazy because I, a psychology professor at McGill University, uh, Jordan Peterson, I think he's at McGill. Um, oh, no, he's University of Toronto. I'm telling you, you're not crazy. And that is his primary value, whether he thinks that's what he's doing or not. Yeah. 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 I, I, I um, you know, my, 
one of the things that, you know, this isn't, and this isn't so much IDW, it's just that a lot of the people in the IDW are like this, right? I mean, there, there is a, recent, a, a sort of a relatively new phenomenon where you, you, you're, a pro, you're a professional of some sort in some industry or in some sector, and you survive a particularly spectacular assault by some woke mob or other. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking Nicholas Christakis. I'm thinking Brett Weinstein. Right. Um, um, Laura Kipnis, although she did not succumb to this. And maybe and she's telling all the credit to her for not doing. Yeah, maybe. The, and I was well, so impressed. We'll be clear what the this is. Right. Um, but um, what happens is these people who may be perfectly great at what they do. I mean, for all I know, Brett Weinstein is a fantastic freaking biology teacher. Right. But because they survived a spectacular and public attack by a woke mob, all of a sudden now it's assumed that they know something about politics and that they have something interesting to say yeah. in a social criticism vein, right? Yeah. And A, that's obviously a non sequitur, right, as a formal matter. But B, as I've found – they don't have any interesting interesting to say, and they don't particularly know much about it. I mean, I mean, Weinstein strikes me as the most egregious example of this, just because of his, you know, humiliating, embarrassing political performances. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole Unity Twenty Twenty thing was like a running joke on on Twitter. I mean, it was such an embarrassment. It was so cringy. I actually watched a lot of the podcasts that he did. Um, just to watch the the, the the dark horse podcast, and in a and he's in a room that this makes me. It looks like something out of Twin Peaks. I mean, it's really just it's like disturbingly. There's too much wood, right? I mean, yeah. it's just. But but what he demonstrated in that whole Unity 2020 campaign, in which they drafted candidates and stuff, was that he has no understanding whatsoever of American politics. Sure. Um, and that he was actually spectacularly ignorant of it. Um, and when combined with sort of like the real, like almost cocky self-assuredness, almost bordering on smugness, it was just such an embarrassing spectacle. It was ha almost harder for me to watch than watching The Office, right? The original Office. Yeah. It was so yeah. cringeworthy. He would, he would say things. And I'd just be like, oh, my God. Um, and... Um, um, I just, you know, Laura Kittness didn't do that, right? I mean, she survived a kind of a woke mob. And then when people tried to drag her into it, yeah. she's like, no, 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 I, I don't. I agree with you on this one thing. I don't agree with you on the 10 others, right? Yes, and she, um, was, <laughs> yeah, she was very explicit about that. I remember yeah. her on, I think it was uh, the Nick Gillespie podcast, Reason Magazine. And he's like, okay, let's talk about how foolish social justice feminism is now that we've talked about Title Line, And she's like, hold on now, Nick. Not going there with you, like I. Yeah, I saw her as part of a panel, a panel where that came out, and it was kind of, it was actually kind of, it kind of um, disturbed and upset the whole panel. It like kind yeah. of broke because yeah. they weren't expecting it. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like, um, in terms of the IDW, then like the broad autopsy. Should we talk? Should we? Is it too early to talk autopsy of the IDW? I don't know. Um, the broad autopsy that I would give it is that this was a movement that ostensibly tried not to get cornered into a tribe and either ended up becoming its own tribe or essentially being pulled in the direction of the conservative tribe. Because when you have these podcasts and you have these people who are funded by, again, like Patreon supporters, you sort of have to play to your audience at least if you're contingent on what your audience wants yeah. to hear from you. Certainly if you're depending on that income. And I feel like yeah. that's what happened to a lot of the IDW. I, I, if there's any exception to that, it's Jordan Peterson, because I think he didn't understand what he was getting himself into. Did you watch the film Rise of Jordan Peterson? No, I, I you know, maybe this is wrong of me. I have very, very negative views of Jordan Peterson. I, I'm, I'm kind of mixed. Not because I think he's a racist or any of that. I just think he's a hack. Again, maybe he's a brilliant psychologist, mm -hmm. but he doesn't know any philosophy and he pretends like he does. 
Um, and it's embarrassing to listen to him talk about philosophy. Yeah, he definitely strays out of his area. It's bothersome to me that people think they're learning philosophy from him. That's really bothersome. Um, um, I mean, shit, I've been doing this show for five years. And I'm actually qualified to talk about philosophy. I actually know what philosophy is, right? Peterson just doesn't, right? I mean, he's just, he's just, he, he's, in terms of philosophy, the man is at best a dilettante. And I would even say that that's saying too well of him um, because he just gets it wrong, right? I did a whole dialogue with Brian Leiter on why yeah. um, uh, identity politics is not only not Marxist, it's the opposite of Marxist, right? Because yeah. Peterson has trained an entire generation yeah. of basement dwellers to yeah. thinking that um, identity politics is a form of Marxism, and it just yeah. isn't, right? I mean, it's just not. And um, um, yeah. the most prominent Marxists today are anti-identity uh, yeah, politics, yeah. Adolf yeah. Reed yeah. being Adolf Reed, I was just one, say. right? Um, yeah. And Leiter being exhibit two. So yeah. I have very negative views of Jordan Peterson, but I assume that you're raising him for a reason. Right. So if you haven't seen The Rise of Jordan Peterson, I highly recommend it. It's a pretty neutral film. I know it got a lot of trouble because people thought it was like a uh, 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 an enconium to uh, Jordan Peterson, and it, it really wasn't. It's When I say that I think Jordan Peterson didn't understand what he was walking into, it's shown in the film. You see this guy who thinks I'm going to become a public intellectual and invite people to think along with me. And what you see is very quickly, the people who he's talking to and are responding to him don't want someone to invite them into a conversation. They want someone to lead them. They want someone to tell them what to do. Yeah. And I, I don't want to psychologize the psychologist, but I found it really troubling that when he wrote his uh, first not his first book, Maps of Meaning, but his book, 12 Rules for Life. It was called 12 Rules for Life. It wasn't 12 Suggestions for Life. It wasn't 12 Hypotheses for Life. It was 12 Rules for Life, meaning I'm going to give you these 12 things that you will that you should follow. And I what's, so like fast, what's so fascinating is, I mean, 12 Rules for Life from a guy whose own life completely disintegrated in public, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go there. But. but you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, you know, th this is the sort of, but this is the kind of cringy thing, right? I mean, it, I don't want to go there either. I don't wish ill upon the man. Nobody should have to suffer a nervous breakdown. So nobody should have to suffer a uh, drug addiction. Nobody has ever, uh, this is not a criticism in that sense, but it's, if my marriage is in a shambles, I don't go out and make speeches about marriages, right? right. If, 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 if I don't, if, you know, it's, 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 it's embarrassing, it's an embarrassment, right? And, and, and it's very telling that it has no effect on the following, right? Yeah. Right. Because you're right. The following is there to have a man who's charismatic read from a script. That's what they're there for. Yes. And they don't care whether the guy turns out to be a turd, whether, I mean, look at Trump. It doesn't matter what the man does. Right. right. It's just we want to line up with someone who can tell us what to do and make it all okay. And like, we don't really have to think yeah. about it too much. And yeah. And I think the death of IDW, look, if IDW had simply wound up becoming an, a, um, an, an, an adjunct to the, the movement, to movement conservatism, yeah. I think it would survive. It would be fine. But I agree with you that it's dying. And that's because it didn't attach itself to movement conservatism. It attached itself to Trump. OK, I mean, you've got James Lindsay, who's one of the IDW people, one of the problems who has completely gone unhinged. Like he's I mean, I have blocked him on Twitter, not because I ever followed him, but because I don't even want to see him show up in the mentions of people that I do follow. Like I, I, I cannot yeah. even bear to listen to the man or read anything he writes. Yeah. The last thing I read by him was him arguing that people should vote for Trump because of identity politics, mm -hmm. right? Yep. He actually tried to coin a word, incon, like incel, mm -hmm. like yeah, he's yeah. been forced, like James Lindsay, the noble liberal, has been forced to become a Trumper yeah. because of of wokeness. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's just so deranged. It's so demented. It's why I got so mad at Spencer. Mm. Um, because Spencer made in this argument, like, Spencer, you're too smart for this. You're yeah, too smart for this. There, there's a rule that I like to follow, and this might pivot us into your uh, movement conservative experience. Sure. 
the rule that I like to follow, and I am finding it so hard to follow it in this tribalized age, the enemy of your enemy is not there by your friend. Right. <laughs> and, and, and again, I'm just going to bring her up because she was such a good example. Laura Kipnis abided by that rule. Yeah. He said, you, Dave Rubin, and I share a common enemy. That does not, however, make us friends. Right. That means I can be on your show and we can talk about the one or two things we agree right. with, and then we can disagree on all the other stuff. Right. And the problem I feel like is a lot of folks, and I guess I'll just share this story because um, it's relevant to illustrate the point. I mean, you know, I, I recall when I would watch some, some intellectual dark web material, um, especially, you know, in, in those instances where I felt like uh, certain woke elements deserved some critique. Um, I would watch something uh, and in the YouTube algorithms, it would be like, well, if you liked that, you would love this article, th this, this video about the death of Western values. You would love this new video about how Islam is, is, is killing the West. And uh, you know, I, I'm like, I, I was, I was formed enough at that time to know not to go there. I was formed enough to know that the enemy of the enemy is not there by your friend, but I can see how people would so easily do that. Like Tim pool, who's kind of like, oh, IDW. That's, an that's another one who IDW. He, he's gone full he, Trump. He, he it did full not Trump. take him long. It did, and it did not take him long to do that. The so, enemy of your enemy is not your friend. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh my God. So then let's pin it then into, um, <laughs> I the am, stuff is so bad. I mean, it's just like, uh, yeah. I really kind of despair. When I'm not laughing, I'm kind of despair, despairing. I mean, um, it has been a really hard year for me because I have really become so dissatisfied with belonging to any group. Yeah, that's going to put any sort of constraints on my thought. Yeah, and it is hard to hold that line. It really is. Because I think the human psyche, we want to be part of a group where we don't have to argue with everyone all the time, where we don't feel like we're swimming upstream. Um, and unfortunately, I've kind of realized that I no such room exists where I feel like I'm swimming with the stream, but that I'm entirely comfortable with. Yeah. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it's just, um, I mean, I just feel so fortunate that I... I'm just fortunate in that I don't need to ever be beholden to anybody um, that I can reject any affiliation yeah. that I can outright go out in public and just burn bridges if I want. Mm, yeah. um, and there'll be no repercussions to me. I do not have to make a living from my, my public intellectual work. So in that sense, it's, I'm, 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 I have, I have tremendous luxury in this regard. Well, let's but, talk about because uh, – But I do care about what's going on. Like, you know what I mean? So when I say I'm despairing, it's not so much personal as that I just am witnessing a kind of disintegration that really is upsetting, and I don't really quite entirely understand why it's happening. And so – yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, because of several decades ago, that was not the case. You had no. a tribe, Dan. Yeah, no. So I, um, yeah, and you express it, and you're not the only one. Several people have asked me. A number of people have asked me to fully recount my my movement of conservative experience, and I do. I do think it's somewhat instructive. I mean, it it, it does tell you some things. Um, so I, I actually published an essay um, on my sort of political journey. Yeah. And it was called adolescent politics because part of what I argued is that really ultimately political identification is ultimately kind of an expression of the adolescent id, right? Um, um, that, that it's something that, that we, that, that we shouldn't think all really all that highly about because it's not particularly mm -hmm. principled. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of described how I kept migrating from one political side to another based on who I hated the most at the moment. Right. Um, and, um, um, so like in high school, I was a liberal in order to annoy the shit out of my friend who was like a rah, rah Reaganite. Right. Um, and then when I got to college, um, uh, there were the first, the first round, the first version of kind of what would become kind of full blown identitarianism and wokeness was starting at places like the university of Michigan back in the eighties. 
And um, that kind of sent me in a more conservative direction by the time I got, so, so I was sort of disgusted by left-wing campus politics. I found it kind of revolting. Were there um, any specific examples? That yeah. You- so I, I actually, in the essay, which I'll link to, I actually, I actually um, uh, have photos, right? So um, two, two examples that, that really stand out that I remember were the sorts of things that made me just disgusted. One was um, that at the time, uh, you still had apartheid in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And so there was a pretty, as you'd expect on campuses, a pretty substantial anti-apartheid movement. I, I obviously don't have any problem with an anti-apartheid movement. What I had a problem with was what, how it was articulated and how it was expressed. Mm-hmm. So what happened was one of the um, anti-apartheid groups built a shanty in the middle of the university quad. So if you know the University of Michigan, the quad is known as the Diag. It's a large space that's bordered by the graduate library, the undergraduate library, some classroom buildings. It's where everybody hangs out. It's where the street preachers used to rant and rave, and you'd go out and have an, you know, amuse yourself by yelling at the street preachers and having them yell back at you. Um, so the, the any part that we built this just really ugly, just trashy shanty in the middle of the – and it was in a, supposed to sort of like symbolize anti-apartheid, right, um, um, which I understand, whatever. Well, of course, then, the Palestinian group – who were protesting Israeli occupation mm. um, then put up an anti-occupation shanty. So now there was a second shanty right in the Diag. Oh boy. Then the Jewish group mm. put up an anti-terrorism. They didn't put up a shanty. They put up a wooden model of a bus on fire. Right. Oh. <laughs> so what happened was eventually the, um, the University of Michigan quad looked like a fucking slum, mm. right? It was like a fucking, and this, I can't even say that my particular reaction to it was primarily intellectual. My, my reactions were visceral, right? It was like, this it, just it was, made me, it made me furious. It was like, right? it's more like the performance became like the important feature, not necessarily yep. the ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And Jonathan shade, it was either shade or somebody else who had been in Michigan around the same time I was actually had an article where they were talking about this, about how, when real activism just turns into performances. Yep. And this was as really much more about social positioning at the university than it was about okay. anything to do with helping anybody suffering from apartheid, um, which is how I saw it. Um, so that was the one. And then the second one was, this was before Martin Luther King Day was a national holiday. So individual states and institutions were deciding whether to give off, days off on Martin Luther King Day. And this debate was going on at the University of Michigan at the time. And at the time, their, the early a proto version of Black Lives Matter was called Black Action Movement, BAM. Mm, okay. Decided to form human chains around classroom buildings, preventing people from going to their own classes during fucking finals week. Wow. And after running one or two of these gauntlets, I got so angry and disgusted that you could have almost gotten me to vote for a Ku Klux Klan holiday by that point. I mean, I was so aggravated at not being able to get to my goddamn class because some punk, some kids, you know, the same age as me are going to surround a building and now I'm going to have to force my way past them. And what, I got to get into a fist fight now to go to my history final. So right. I just got really kind of angry and disgusted. And explain, and explain to them while you're doing it that this is not a disrespect to Martin Luther King Jr. I just yeah, and my exam. Anyone who knows my temperament would know that once I'm in that mood, I wouldn't explain. I would just punch you in the face and right. knock you down, right? right. Um, 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 I, I just... Any kind of effort at coercion like that, I react to in a very violent kind of aggressive manner because I don't feel like I'm being engaged with right. discursively. Right. And so then, okay, then, then, then it's a contest of strength. Let's see who wins, right? Let's see who wins the fight. That, yeah. That's my attitude when I get confronted this way. Yeah. And so um, I just really got turned off. Then we hit the 90s. I moved to New, back to New York City. I start graduate school at the Kinney Graduate Center. And at the time, this is when the academic culture wars started. Mm. 
So this is the time of the Alan Sokol hoax. Mm -hmm. This was the time when the primary expression of identity politics was primarily through the curriculum. Right. So -hmm. there was this effort to try to um, diversify or decolonize, they didn't call it decolonize then, the curriculum. So, for example, I'm teaching um, at a school in the Bronx, a community college in the Bronx I'm teaching, in what was called the freshman year initiative. The idea was that um, the public high schools in the South Bronx were such an overwhelming disaster that the students were coming into the community colleges with such a wide array of educational disadvantages that um, there had to be some experience that they all had that would get them to a common place that you could then start the curriculum on. So the idea was to have the freshman initiative be multidisciplinary surveys, right? Mm -hmm. So I taught multidisciplinary surveys courses that included literature, history, philosophy, religion, art, and architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Did I say music? No. And music. And music. Okay. And what I basically did, it was a course basically from ancient Greece up to the 20th century. A course. A course, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Did it from scratch. I had to teach myself whole disciplines. I taught myself medieval history. I taught myself all this stuff. And my working idea was this. This is what I thought I was doing. I am teaching in one of the most underprivileged environments in the country. Every student in my class is either black, Puerto Rican, or Dominican. Every single one of them lives in some kind of a dysfunctional or broken family in a dysfunctional crime-ridden neighborhood. Therefore, what I should do, what I, my duty is, I'm going to give them an education that somebody else would have to pay $30,000, $40,000 for at Harvard. I'm going to give these kids Harvard-level education, which is what I did. Right. Which means, you know, Greek philosophy. It means, you know, Mozart and Beethoven. It means, um, you know, uh, 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 James Joyce. It means, you know, all that. Right. Yeah. That's what I thought my duty was in confronting this population in this environment. That's what I thought being um, progressive and forward thinking and, um, um, being uh, charitable in that sense meant, right? Yeah. Well, then I get to the sort of the work working sessions before this thing starts. And I'm being told, oh, don't make them listen to classical music. You should have like hip hop and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, why? Well, because they're black. Right. They won't be able to identify with, you know, the same shit you hear now, by the way. Right. The exact same thing you should hit now. Black and Puerto Rican students, they should, you should be teaching them black and Puerto Rican literature, music, history, not all this other stuff. And I thought to myself, that's just, how is that any better educationally than sticking them in a fucking ghetto? Right? How is that, an, how is that any better intellectually than, than and so I, I really resented this. I thought this was the ugliest that, stuff. Uh, what? Because presumably they have access to, uh, you know, rap music, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know what else was brought up. Like, you know, uh, what Iceberg Slim? I, I mean, I don't know. It's presumably they have access to those things outside of school. The, the it was shocking was, to me. It was shocking to me. Of course, I ignored it entirely, and I did what I wanted. And um, I will just—I'll just recount two very, very short stories, just to show you why I know I was right. Right. Not only did this resonate; it resonated hugely. First of all, these students are not stupid. They're sharp as hell. They had to grow up way earlier than we did. They know when they're being condescended to and when they're being taken seriously. And they knew they could see right away that I was taking them very seriously, that I was giving them everything that I could possibly give them. Um, and they resonated with the material precisely because it was entirely new to them. Mm. I'll give you two examples. One was I had a student, a black student, I mean, this, this kid was so educationally behind that I would, when we got to Shakespeare, so I did Shakespeare's The Tempest, um, not just because it's a great play, but because it includes themes about modernity and the enlight- and, 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 and enlightenment and, and, and all sorts of things that, that, 
that I thought were really important uh, 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 things for the students to, to think about and talk about. But this kid could not read it. I would sit with him for hours going through reading it line by line together, right? Mm. So that's how educationally um, um, deprived the kid was. But by the end of the course, he was so Im- Im- impressed. He was really impressed by Baroque music, hmm. by Bach. Yeah. At the end of the semester, he not only wrote me a very moving letter about what, about what the class had meant to him, but he actually, he, I didn't know this, was a rapper. Hmm. He wrote raps over the Brandenburg concertos. Oh, beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had another girl, Dominican, who the summer after I get a letter from her filled with photographs. She was so moved by the units on the Renaissance that she saved up all the money from her job in order to afford a trip to Florence Mm. and sent me photos of herself in buildings that I had showed them slides of. Mm. I'm getting moved just just talking about this. I could cry talking about this, right? This is what, this to me is what I was fucking there for, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, and all the messaging coming at me is that what I'm doing is racist and that what I should be doing is condescending, pandering, and I don't know what, leaving the ghettoizing them forever, right? To permanently. Yeah. And this upset me tremendously. It still does. Yeah. And it's what got me into the intellectual wing of the conservative movement. That's when I joined National Association of Scholars. Do you feel like this is? Do you feel like this was an instance of um, your enemy, the the enemy of the enemy, becoming your friend because of it being the enemy of the enemy? Or no, feel- it was more naivete. Okay, I thought that these institutions actually meant what they said, hmm. and I was going to be a good soldier for what I thought was a good cause. It wasn't enemy of my enemy. Okay. Yeah. I already had enough, was enough angry with campus liberals from Michigan in the eighties to that when this hit and now I'm experiencing it at this, at the next level up. And now it's coming at me. I'm seeing where it's coming from. Mm. That then led me to say, okay, who, who, who do I lie? Whose values do I lie with? Well, it seems like I lie with the values of these people over here mm. and they were the movement conservatives. Because at the time, the people arguing for the traditional Western canon for everyone yeah. and against ghettoized education were the conservatives. It was Alan Bloom, who is not even a conservative, but that book, Closing right. in the American Mind. Isn't that, isn't that an amazing fact as people forget yeah. that? Is he yeah, he's not a conservative. A conservative. Um, but he articulated. But that you know, gets us into the complicated thing about the Straussians and where they fit into the conservative, yeah, movement, which, yeah, which yeah. is we, yeah. we could do another talk, another lecture, uh, discussion on. Yeah. So anyway, so I joined NAS. At the time, the City University of New York was undergoing a real crisis, um, because of the pitiful conditions of schooling in the inner city. And because of the then pathetic schooling that was going on at the community colleges, we were getting students at the four-year colleges that simply required so much remediation that you couldn't teach the subject. So by this point, I was teaching at Baruch College, which is a, a CUNY four-year. And, um, and I was also teaching at the New York Institute of Technology, which is private and a four-year. And... Um, the students coming in were so underprepared that you couldn't teach the curriculum. You had to teach your students how to read and write. There was no even question that they were going to read Descartes or something. I mean, it was just not possible, right? Right. So I joined up with a bunch of like-minded faculty at the Graduate Center to form an NAS chapter in CUNY. Mm. Because at the time, Major uh, Mayor, then Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. Talk about somebody who, 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 you know, if you want to talk about the worst migration yeah. over into Trump land, he's the worst. I think he's the most embarrassing example of them all because he was a serious guy once, yeah. a guy that you could respect, a guy who, in my opinion, saved New York City. Mm. 
I lived through Dinkins and then, and I, all the revisionists are going to come in the comments and tell me about how things were getting better under Dinkins, whatever. I lived through it. All right. I was there when it happened. Okay. I was there when all those riots were happening and the, the Hasids and the black people were killing, rioting against each other, murdering each other. And also when the crime level was through the fucking roof in the city. Yeah. I mean, I don't know enough of the data here. I just know that, um, I've heard a lot of folks who I respect and trust on this say that, you know, crime went down in various cities at around the same time and, and chronologists just simply don't, un, don't know exactly what happened. Yeah. They tried to adjust for all sorts of variables. To it's, and it's probably the sort of thing that you can never, you're just never going to know. Um, you just can't have that kind of knowledge okay, in social it's science. That it wasn't just in New York. Yeah. Right? It was, um, it was in a lot of places that didn't have, the Republican governor. And- so I could be wrong about this, but look, the, certainly the perception of the time was that Giuliani had essentially saved the city. Yeah. And um, he had created a CUNY task force to take recommendations for the formation, for the, for the reformation reforming of, of CUNY. Yeah. And so our chapter, which had been newly formed, Van AS, had direct access to policymaking in the city university system because of the Giuliani mayorship and the task force. And so we were able to sort of be a part of, we were able to, we were able to testify at hearings. We were able to sort of, you know, so I was in the movement came in from academia. Yeah. I then wanted to further advance in the movement. So then I approached national review at the time, Mm. William F. Buckley was still the overlord the editor at the time was John O'Sullivan, which, if you don't know, was a former speechwriter for Margaret Thatcher. Okay. He's a Brit. Also a serious guy. I mean, whatever you may think of him, he's a serious guy. I don't. Yeah, I don't. And I, he's a real movement conservative, yeah. real movement conservative, as obviously Buckley was. So I pitched an idea for a column to them. I said, OK, um, National Review at the time was the only conservative magazine that was published, not published from Washington, D.C., but was published from New York. Hmm. And I thought, why not have a column that is, in a sense, an expression of of the New York brand of conservatism, right? The, the, hmm. the National Review, to, to sort of separate it from the American Spectator, the Weekly Standard, which came out, and those yeah. others. Yeah. And so I pitched a, a column called New York Journal. And um, I wrote a bunch of dummy articles and I pitched it directly to William F. Buckley Jr. I sent it to him. Wow. At the time I was 26 years old. I was done with all my coursework. I was ABD. I was at the time working both teaching classes and working at the Jewish theological seminary as an assistant to the Dean of the undergraduate college. Mm. And I mean, when students tell me now they work a lot, I, I laugh at them. I probably had three jobs at one time while I was writing a dissertation. And college was more affordable at that point in time. <laughs> well, grad school is a different story. Yeah, yeah, grad school is a different story. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know if, if you're going to grad school and paying, you shouldn't be going. Um, right. Um, um, anyway, I'm, I'm not professional school. I mean, talking about academic grad Yeah, school. yeah, academic. So I pitched the article. I got a letter back from William F. Buckley Jr. Loved the idea, loved the columns, invited me to a meeting with all the editors of National Review to pitch it. Mm. So I went to lunch. They had their their meet, editorial meetings at like a five star restaurant in New York. So I went to lunch at, with them, met all the editors of Natural View, and live in person pitched the idea to all of them. Yeah. Little did I know that they don't. This was pro forma. It was already a done deal. It was already decided. After lunch, John O'Sullivan took me out. We went for a walk, and he told me, "Here you go." Da 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 da. And then he said, "The guy you're going to work under." is the the section you're going to be in is the arts and letters section. And that was run by then the guy, his name is David Klinghoffer. He has since left national review and become a discovery Institute kook. So he's a crackpot. He's like, he's like a, he's like a, a convert to Judaism, not just convert to Judaism, but convert to Orthodox Judaism, which if you could imagine, Orthodox Judaism is bad enough, but if you can imagine the worst version of it, it's a convert to it, right? Mm. Um, 
but at the time yet he wasn't a kook yet. He was just, you know, the, the arts and arts editor. Yeah. And so then I started. So I wrote columns. I wrote a column, a column about the uh, the never ending work on the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I wrote a column about, you know, um, the back stock, the stuff that's not on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is about eighty percent of what they own. I did a column about a, a, a bar that was a former speakeasy that you had to people had to tell you where it was or you wouldn't find it. And yeah. the reason it was interesting was because it was a bar that celebrities would go to all the time because they knew that nobody there would give a shit about them and would be interested in them and they would be left alone. Interesting. So I did these kinds of columns, right? But all from a kind of a conservative attitude. Yeah. Right. I wanted to sort of mix. It sounds almost like um, the stuff that Kevin Williamson has been doing, like in his yeah. big white ghetto uh, yeah. which I've been reading yeah. a lot of that is just, yeah. it's, it's not conservative per se. There's nothing in there that's yeah. like, I want to hammer conservative points home, but yeah. it all does kind of have a certain theme in the background. So let me just tell you now about the falling out. Right. So, yeah, so yeah. that's a this went on part, as always is. So, so we're talking about 96 is when this started all of this 94, 94 was the NAS stuff started. And then 96 was the column at national review. I would say I was peak conservative movement guy by the end of the, of the 1990s by the, by the, by the turn of the, by the turn of the millennium. Okay. Um, got the job at, okay. So first of all, falling out with national review. Yeah. So I was subjected. What I found out was I thought it was great to have been brought in by the top guy that, that, that William F. Buckley jr. Brought me in. I thought that was great. It meant that I was like star boy. Right. Mm -hmm. What I found out was, it made me hated by everybody there already, right? Because, mm. so my section editor, Klinghoffer, fucking hated me. Because they, because you leapfrogged people? Right, because he probably know. started at the water cooler and like had to like, you know, started by as the coffee boy and yeah. worked his way up. And I just walked right in, at the, right, right into the spot. Probably annoyed the shit out of him. Um. He also wanted to, he didn't like my ideas. He wanted to do different kinds of stuff. Um, and he just completely put the molasses into the, to the publishing schedule. So, I mean, I had a backlog of stuff with him. I was constantly asking when things were going to come out and he would just hem and haw and push it further and further. Mm. Um, I would have to like, like email him or call him. But by that point, I think that we, we were using email. Um, and threatened to show up at his office if he didn't fucking answer me and tell me what the hell was going on. So is this a little bit of like jockeying for position in some way? He was basically trying to keep me in my place and say, okay, okay now right. you're going to pay your dues with me. I know you think you're a hot shot. Okay. But you're going to pay your dues. So the first thing I discovered was that within the movement conservative, within movement conservatism, there was the exact same petty adolescent, essentially high schoolish administrative politics as anywhere else that the fact that you were in a movement meant nothing right the principle didn't filter down into the operation that was mm. the first thing i realized okay. um and going back to mr hughes he's gonna find out about the manhattan institute because mm -hmm. they're all like this right they're all like this um so that was really bothersome mm. then but i stuck with it but then john o'sullivan retired and Rich Lowry became the editor, and he's the editor now. Yep. At the time, Rich Lowry was 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 looked like he was twelve years old. I mean, he was like a kid. He wasn't in five minutes before I got axed. Because there was no, because um, there was no kind of uh, loyalty in terms of. It's like the it's like the quarterback who's hired by one coach. The coach leaves exactly, and the is, exactly. He's gone. Right. So I get axed. I had only published three columns. I had five in the backlog when I got axed. Okay, fine. I got axed. Change of editors. This happens, right? I, I right. But then, not a few months later a new column appears oh. called city desk with Ooh. exactly the same beat as mine. Hmm. But now written by Richard Brookheiser, who's one of their senior editors. Hmm. So basically I'd been brought in 
on the basis of my idea, this is my concept. I was then fired. The concept was then taken and given to one of their inside people. So this fucking pissed me off. So I wrote William F. Buckley Jr. And I just basically told him, I basically, I didn't say fuck you, but I said, you guys are a bunch of conniving, thieving bastards. Hmm. I said, let's just say, I, I can remember this. I said, let's call this what this is. You stole my idea and you gave it to one of your friends. Hmm. That's what this is. Yeah. Don't try to deny it. Right. I actually got a letter back from William F. Buckley Jr. Telling me to go fuck, you know, telling me off, saying to me, we did nothing of the sort. Richard Brookheiser has been with us since he was 16 years old. I can imagine how he would have said that as well. Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, we have done nothing of the sort. He wrote me in the letter back. So that was my first blow it was kind of like, okay. Yeah. I joined this thing because I thought that my ideas and values aligned with theirs. And I thought that they were a force for what I viewed as goods. Right. But I, st- I, st- I first saw the first inkling of the, the, the dirtiness underneath. But I stayed in the movement because I was still very much involved with NAS. Mm-hmm. Then I, oh. move, I take the job in philosophy at Missouri State. I moved to Springfield. Yeah. And because of my conservatism and my public conservatism, yeah, yeah. I almost didn't get tenure. Yeah, I was going to, that had to be. um, So I had people uh, in my department who were trying to deny me tenure on the basis of all kinds of concocted stuff because they couldn't come right out and say. Yeah, sure. Especially not in Springfield, Missouri, which is one of the most right wing parts of the country. So you couldn't say. Yeah. But what they did was, (laughs) you know, I had one guy try to accuse me of plagiarism. Yeah. Of plagiarizing my articles. I had someone else, this was really early for this. I had someone else telling me that I, what I should use gender inclusive language. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it, it's funny. It, it, just, just as a brief aside, it sounds like when I was going on the job market for jobs in the field of education, which is, um, you know, a very, a, a very anti market kind of area. And I did a lot of my research undergraduate and, or graduate level on, um, you know, school choice and marketization and stuff like that. And some of the groups that I was affiliated with, uh, I don't want to name the names. No, I don't think you should. Some of the big libertarian kind of groups, uh, some people there told me in very well-meaning ways, like you should probably not put certain articles on your CV uh, because they have certain titles uh, that will. And I decided, no, I'm going to put them on. First of all, I don't want to be accused of lying because someone could easily look me up and find these articles. And if that happens, I've basically misrepresented myself. But secondly, it was like, you know, no, if, if an organization doesn't want to hire me because of my political affiliation at that time, um, it's probably best that we don't. Yeah. I don't want to be at that. And, and, and fortunately, I did not find the sort of bias that they had predicted that I would find, which would even surprise me. Yeah. Um, I just got to let my dog out. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Last year. Go. Go. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the problem, what happened was on a particular search when I was on my on-campus visit, uh, I did get some questions about someone said, Oh, you know, so-and-so is looking over your application. It looks like you're some sort of conservative. I said, well, no, not, not quite. Let me, you know, explain to you where I am. Um, and I, apparently that, that sufficed, I guess. So, so you know, I was advised to hide it. Yep. I did hide it. I probably wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been hired had I not hidden it. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was pre really still very early internet. Yeah. It was possible to hide it. You couldn't hide right, it now. Right. Right. Um, but once I was there, yeah, I was open about it. Right. <clears throat> so anyway, I, they tried. Not be? Yeah, it's they tried to deny me tenure, and um, I sued them. Hmm. I just, I just, <clears throat> they they tried to get me to play all the games of the internal, um, uh, the internal procedures. So like you know, yeah, yeah, you know, you can appeal, you can. I said no, 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 no. I just hired a lawyer. From now on, don't say a word to me. 
Everything yeah. goes through my life. I just terrorized them, basically, is what I did. Yeah, I mean, the internal um, process is like asking Microsoft's HR department to handle contract disputes with Microsoft right. workers. So I just sort of terrorized them. You know, they tried to hit me, and I just basically stomped them into this, their faces into the ground is what I did. So I got tenure. But there was a period. There was about a year where I thought I wasn't going to get tenure. So I was looking for other jobs. Yeah. <clears throat> At this point, my – cachet and the and the NAS was high enough that because the CUNY chapter had been so successful, the head of NAS, Steve Balch, asked me to um, help revive a moribund chapter in St. Louis. So I was taking four hour drives back and forth to St. Louis multiple times to help revive this chapter. And I did it. I did it out of loyalty to the movement. Okay. Well, now I thought I wasn't going to get tenure and I had to look for another job. <clears throat> and a job came up that I wanted. You're going to laugh when you hear what the job was. <laughs> they were looking for Hillsdale College. Yep. Oh, yep. Oh, yep. Was looking for a head, was looking for a headmaster for their preparatory school. Oh, boy. So they have a prep school in addition to the college. Yeah. And they were looking for a headmaster. And at the time I thought this would be the ideal job for me because I, I've always had a very large sort of big vision in terms of just like, you know, I always thought the idea of like having my own school yeah, <clears throat> with a very, very handpicked selected student body and all that would be like the sort of the pinnacle of what I could do. And uh, because I had very, I very specific and, 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 you know, set ideas about edu- about education. Yeah. And I knew that with an an active re- a recommendation and a phone call from the head of NAS, right. I'd be very competitive for this job. Right. They re- wouldn't help me at all. Wow. NAS did nothing for is me. That, nothing. Is nothing. That because, uh, is that because you would have <clears throat> lost your academic Stay. No, I, I don't know why. No, it was because I realized that despite all my service, right, I still wasn't considered an inside. I, I still wasn't considered an insider, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's. I don't want to sound like conspiratorial, but it sounds like it could also be something like, well, you know, Dan has value because he is a, a like a, a professor in a philosophy department. Um, he would do that, and he wouldn't have as much value to us. Yeah, in terms of the name or the prestige, or I, I am not gonna, I am not gonna div- divine Steve Balch's intentions. I'm just saying, my reaction at the time was so, so, so. My impression was, okay, wait a minute. I've now, by this point, been a movement conservative for ten years. Yeah, I've operated within it at very high levels. Yeah. I've shown unbelievable amounts of loyalty and dedication to it. And now I'm asking for something and I'm getting bupkis. I'm getting nothing. Right. Zip. And I realized <clears throat> I'm still not considered an insider. I'm still not considered a part of the gang, right? I'm still not the, a guy. I don't still don't have the kind of relationship where we help each other out, man. Right. Where loyalty is, where loyalty operates. Right. Yeah. And, um, that was when I, that was when I finally completely broke with the movement. Okay. Now as a separate matter, I was not going to be able to stay a conservative once I moved to Southern Missouri, because what being a conservative in Southern Missouri means right. is it's very right. different from what being a conservative in New York, New York city means. Yeah. So I right. was never going to become anti-abortion. I was never going to become anti-gay. I was never going to become, get rid of all the Mexicans. I was never going to become a right. fundamentalist Christian. Right. I was never going to become any of those things. And that's what conservatism means here. Right. Right. And so I was going to leave the movement anyway, probably. I mean, what about, what about after 2001? I mean, after September 11, 2001, my read on that whole thing is conservatism took a really huge pivot towards almost like a more technocratic conservatism, um, even more than it already had been. You know what? I just don't know because at, by that point, my, 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 all my, all my activity within the movement, was in the academic wing. Right. So I was, wasn't really aware that much of what was going on across the rest of the movement. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just saying now in hindsight, I left the movement yeah. because I found out 
that no amount of service to it or loyal to it was ever going to be enough. Right. Right. That, that fundamentally underneath the banner, they were a bunch of just unprincipled mercenary nepotists, right? Mm -hmm. That that's in a sense what movements are, right? Yeah. And, um, um, and, um, um, but what I'm saying in hindsight is I probably would have wound up having to leave the movement anyway, because I would have simply have no longer been able to call myself a fellow traveler. We would just would have disagreed with too much. Right. You would have run afoul at some publication. Right. No, I I wouldn't have had to run afoul. I would have refused to do it. Right. I mean, I would not have. So that's my tale. That's my sort of tale. And I just, when I saw how fast Mr. Hughes was diving in, Right. I immediately thought of myself at his age and thought, my God, A, I wasn't that young when I dove in. It would have been right. even worse if I dove in, dove in that young. Right. I mean, you had a PhD and you were still unaware of, kind of how the mechanics would operate once you were kind of far enough in the movement that it was hard to leave. Right. And the movement when I was in it was a much healthier movement than it is now. Now the movement has been so broken by Trump. Yeah. That it's like swimming in toxic yeah. waste. I mean, I wouldn't want to go anywhere near the movement at this point until until it's sorted out. It's Trump problem. Yeah. I don't think any decent person should or could be associated with the movement, right? I mean, and and be intellectually honest with themselves about what they're associating with, right? So yeah, so okay, so that's that puts a lot of clarity on where if we go back to the discussion about Coleman Hughes. Um, because I thought, I mean, my big concerns were with the ideas that he would find himself just locked into this world of ideas that in some way ends up bounding him in ways that he may not appreciate later on. Whereas yours are more like, I don't think you understand how the sausage works in the organizations you're a part of. <clears throat> See, I don't know, because I could easily hear someone saying like, you know, he's got a really successful Patreon platform. He's got a really successful podcast. He's kind of a brand in some ways. Um, I, I feel like City Journal probably needs him in more ways than he might feel like he needs them. And listen, if that's true, then I'm wrong about this, right? I mean, there's still the question of being associated with a movement that has not yet figured out how to what to do about its Trump problem. I would still have that concern. But yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, look, I could be wrong about this. And I'm not like some kind of, you know, it doesn't matter what I think in a certain sense, right? But, um. But I, you know, I have a platform here. I talk about these issues. I'm interested in them. I, I view myself as part of a network of content providers. And so when other people do stuff that catches my attention, I want to say something about it. Yeah. And, um, I mean, my so, problem, yeah. My, I mean, my problem within movements has always been more ideological. I have this kind of competing, these competing aspects of my psyche. The first is, I think, a more general human thing of like wanting to belong to something, wanting to be in rooms where I said, like I said, you're not continually feeling like you're swimming upstream. Like, these are my people. These are the people that are espousing the thing, you know, like, like we talked about early, like consuming it therapeutically. Like these are the people I don't have to argue with. Yeah. Um, but then at some point I have this other aspect of my psyche, which is really uncomfortable with consensus, especially when there are glaringly obvious points that people are missing because they all agree. Yeah. And at some point I want to play the role of the, the kind of bomb thrower the just, let me throw a few, let me, let me poke this part of the balloon and see if it pops. Yeah. Um, and people aren't, tend, <clears throat> people don't tend to be very appreciative of that. I, I just find that, um, I mean, I don't know how specific I should get that. I, I was recently involved in um, a group, that's associated with self-directed learning, self-directed education. Um, I don't know if I should name the group, but, um, and it, I just find that groups like this and other groups I've been affiliated with, there's a large potential to become a thought bubble where it's more like homo, like, uh, homogeneity and purity of ideology is valued more than yeah. anything else. And in this particular situation, my read was, they would sort of up the purity tests every once in a while. Like, no, you also have to believe this too. No, you also have to believe this too. And in a lot of ways, you know, it's similar to the way often like cults work, which is that you, the cult members find value in becoming, in being part of a tight knit close group. And the larger the group grows, the less special individual members feel and the more, 
potential there is for <clears throat> impurity within the movement. Yeah. And that's when you notice like pe- the, the kind of purity test that excise members periodically. And I'll just say, I don't tend to survive those. Not because I don't believe in the core thing of that group, but because I'm willing to say, here are some of the flaws. Yeah. Here are some of the downsides to what, uh, what this is or, or that part of the purity test isn't necessary. Yeah. To be part of this group. Uh, and they yeah, say, I, oh, I, if you think that, then you're obviously not a part of this group. Um, I and- never, I never wanted that aspect of it. I mean, I've always been the, part, the sort that wants to be in the minority in any group he's in, right? So, I mean, you know, I grew up in a super Jewish part of Long Island. I mean, I went to a public high school that was over 90% Jewish, which if you think about the demographics of the country is very unusual, course, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I went to the University of Michigan and, you know, 15 people from my graduating class went to the University of Michigan. It was one of the very popular choices for people from Long Island. And um, not only did I not want anything to do with them, um, <clears throat> when I went and ran and joined the Greek system, <clears throat> I wanted to join the a fraternity with the fewest Jews possible, right? Mm-hmm. So not only did I join, not join one of the Jewish fraternities, I joined a fraternity founded by Confederate soldiers. Like, Ooh, I mean, like, wow. you know what yeah. I mean? Like I, I never, ever wanted to be, I never, I never joined when I was never attracted to the movement because I wanted this band of brothers and with whom I would belong and with whom I wouldn't have, I never wanted the therapeutic. Yeah. Anytime I was in an institution, I always tried to make trouble in it. Um, um, it's just my nature. It definitely comes from my father. It's the kind of person he, he is also. Yeah. Um, I joined the movement because I actually believed that I was aligned with its, values yeah. and i actually believe that it was it was earnest right in the pursuit of those values and now i think the same thing about mr hughes okay. i don't get the sense that he needs to get along uh, to find to have a band of brother i feel like he thinks right that his values align. and what i what i'm worried about is a i think he doesn't understand the institutions have no these institutions don't have any values they're not earnest or the values that they have are public facing values, not, not yeah, they're not earnest. Well, that's the not earnest part, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that when it comes to the values, uh, when it comes to any conflict between the values and sort of nepotistic considerations, the values will go right out the window and you'll get chucked right under the right out, right, right off the side, right? right. Um, um, well, you know, also, the minute uh, somebody comes along who can do what he, what he, what Mr. Hughes does, but who's, you know, the brother of Ryan Salam or, or, or is the best friend of what so and so, he's going to get tossed, right? right. Um, um, that's number one. And number two, I just think that he's too young and too early and too undeveloped um, to be to be joining a movement where the movement is now going to become his voice, right? I mean that that's going to become because his own is undeveloped, right? Um, right. Um, you know, if this if he was ten years older, I probably wouldn't even been saying anything about it. It's because he's so damn young <clears throat> and so new and fresh yeah. that I just. Yeah. I knowing now what I know about movements and about this movement, yeah. um, especially um, I just was concerned from along those lines. Do you so. ever feel like, do you ever feel like you ever got to the point in the conservative movement where the thoughts you were thinking about issues started with what should a conservative be ending up with? Never. See, I, I never, never I, once. I say, yeah. Okay. So I, I basically, I, I, I would look for who aligned most with what I already thought. Right. Yeah. See, I, I know this is going to sound, it's, it's going to make me sound horrible, but um, I, I have sort of had that situation, that weird psychological situation where you only realize in retrospect, um, like once I started kind of really shedding the libertarian label <laughs> and, and affiliation and whatnot, could I really seriously like entertain gun gun regulation arguments without thinking I have to do this so I can re- rebut it. Right. Like I have yeah. to do this so that I can figure out where it's wrong. Yeah. Um, like, and it's, <clears throat> and I, again, I know it, it probably doesn't make me sound very good, but I, you know, it, the, when I left um, this organization that's involved with self-directed education, I had to step back and say, what is it about self-directed education do I like? And what about self-directed education did this group kind of nudge me into liking? Yeah. 
uh, if that makes sense. So I'm sorry, yeah. it's probably vague for people. Look, I, I think that, look, obviously it's common. And obviously, it's uh, you know what, you, what you, it's obviously a, an, always a danger, right? But 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 I guess what I'm saying is, and we should probably close on this because we've been yeah. gone two hours. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what I guess I'm saying is, I think what you're describing is much less likely to happen to a person who's already much more well developed and mature. Yes, and that it's much more likely to happen to someone who's still not formed. Oh yeah. And I don't think he's formed. What I've read of his just sounds to me like shit I read all the time from everybody else yeah. in black movement conservatism. The, the way I think of it, just to make sure it doesn't sound like it's his fault or we're saying he's thin or whatever, it's every single young writer, whether it's a songwriter or a playwright or a novelist, starts by imitating. Absolutely. You don't have enough in you yet. Absolutely. To produce by self-generating. You imitate. Absolutely. And only when you're older do you start to really com- create all the composites of the things you've read. You can start to weave them together into your own. Absolutely. I feel like maybe what you're saying is that he's maybe sort of still in that phase where just because he's young, yeah. because he doesn't have that experience, yeah. he's yeah. sort of imitating at a point. Uh, he's, he's doing it so early that I'm worried it's going to con- actually stunt yeah. his development and growth as yeah. a writer and as a thinker. Yeah. When I got into it, I was already so far well developed as a writer and a thinker that there was no chance of me getting getting co opted by anybody. Yeah. Um. And but ultimately, that's not what ran me afoul of the conservative movement. What ran ran me afoul was the discovery that the movement was really ultimately under the surface. Was just like yeah. every other institution was was governed by nepotism and by you know, mercenary kind of, you know, considerations and. Yeah. Then in that case, uh, I'm going to go with the answer that I think uh, city journal needs Coleman Hughes more than Coleman Hughes needs city journal. And um, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Um, if that's um, true. He'll be fine at least in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks so much. Um, this is, I know it's long, but you know, I think people will find this interesting. And of course, nobody's forced to watch an entire dialogue. Um but um, I really appreciate uh, appreciate what you talking about this, and um, yeah, you too. I I, I like uh, I, I it was interesting hearing the stories, and um, uh, I'll see you in the next one. I'm sure we're going to do many more, um, yeah. and uh, that you and I look forward to maybe you hosting your own with some other interlocutors at some point. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'll catch you around the next time. Very nice, Dan. All right, my friend. Take Thank care. Ciao.